Um, welcome to the panel discussions of the Soundstar program, a uh, Soundstar uh, Symposium 2015. Um, my name is Hirochi Takeuchi. Uh, I'm an associ associate professor of political science and the director of Soundstar program in Japan East Asia uh, in um, um, the Tower Center. Yesterday, um, we started uh, with uh, Ambassador Armitage's, uh, um, I would say, very uh, provocative and insightful um, uh, speech. And then today, uh, our discussion uh, continues um, about uh, uh, the changing dimensions of Japanese nationalism and its, its interactions and implications uh, on the world. Japan's, Japan's national identity is changing uh, in important and significant ways, and in many ways, Japan finds itself at the start of the 21st century in the domestic and international political uh, environment that has changed uh, dramatically. So the theme of this year is, uh, the theme of this year's Star Symposium is Waiting for the Rising Sun, Japanese New Nationalism and Beyond. Beyond part is, I think, important. Um, <laughs> this is actually the same theme as the Sanster the Symposium in January 2008. Um, at that time, if you recall, um, it was several, a few, a few months after uh, Prime Minister Abe resigned, actually. And now uh, Prime Minister Abe is back. And between these two terms of uh, Mr. Abe, there um, have been, um, there have, uh, there have been um, um, five prime ministers um, in five years. So now Japan is back to the kind of the prime minister-like calendar. Um, I'm a China specialist. And uh, when, so I'm, I say I'm a China specialist, people often ask me, is China a threat for the United States? And I'm originally from Japan, so um, I'm um, often asked, is Japan important? So as I said in, uh, in the last yesterday's dinner, well, my argument is Japan is important for the United States to manage China. So in that sense, the increasing importance of China has made Japan even more important. And then this, is, this has been shared with the keynote speakers of the previous Sandstar Symposia, such as Ambassador Tom Schieffer uh, and J uh, Secretary James Steinberg. And now it is uh, joined by um, uh, Ambassador Armitage. So while we often talk about whether China is a threat for the United States, how about which country is the biggest threat for China? I often ask this question in my class to the students. Is it US? Maybe Japan? Or Russia, the long like, borders shared with China? Well, my argument is China's biggest threat is China. Well, Chinese government, Chinese leaders are afraid of the people, people who are dissatisfied with state and society. Last year, I published a book about political economy of rural China, titled Tax Reform in Rural China, Revenue Resistance and Authoritarian Rule. When I was conducting field research in China, I was aware that Chinese leaders were concerned with the people's dissatisfaction turned into the political instability, and it might threaten regime survival. Since 2011, the Chinese government has spent more for police than national defense. And popular protests sometimes have been escalated into attacking local government's building and property. In the meantime, no foreign, gov uh, no, no foreign forces have attacked any government building in China since the establishment of People's Republic of China. Japanese call internal threat, naiyu, and external threat, gaikan. So and then we usually say nai, naiyu, gaikan, meaning um, so the both um, internal threat and external threat. And China is concerned with naiyu, internal threat, when managing foreign policy. President Xi Jinping lifts from Huayan slogans, such as 
the China dream, and the great restoration of the Chinese nation. He seems challenging US-led international order by establishing the AIIB, Asian uh, in, uh, infrastructure, in, infrastructure Investment Bank, and seeking security system excluding the United States in uh, East Asia and maybe Western side, uh, Western half of the Asia Pacific, which is called Guam West of the, of the Pacific. But I doubt that China, which is concerned with NIU internal threat, have an intention and capability to provide security and stability in East Asia, even if Chinese power, China has become uh, more powerful and expands sphere of influence to replace the current US status. Having said that, however, China is rising. That is the reality. And we should keep in mind that US-China relationship, not US-Japan relationship, is the most important bilateral relationship in the world. It doesn't mean it is problem free. Actually, there are many problems, and then problems make US-Japan relationship more important. In the meantime, I would say Japan is the most important treaty-based ally for the United States. Last November, the Tower Center held the National Security Conference, and its theme was the United States and China, strategy, competition, and innovation. The keynote speaker was Dr. Tom Finger, a China specialist at Stanford University, who were in the State Department for a long time. He argued that the pivot to Asia is the basis of the US grand strategy, and the engagement with China is inevitable to pivot Asia. The, uh, the people to Asia must be backed by capability, which should be provided by US military presence in Asia and economic treaties such as the Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP. The US engagement policy towards China is based on what I call the trinity of liberalism in international relations theory. That is econom economic interdependence, international rule of law, and democracy. The idea is that by engaging China in, into global economic interdependence, we give China an incentive to follow US-led international order, and perhaps China may be democratized in the long run. How long it is, I don't know. This year is the 70th anniversary of ending World War II. Japan has enjoyed the prosperity based on the trinity of liberalism for the last seven decades. It is also the basis of US-Japan alliance. So does nationalism, uh, this conference theme, contradict the trinity of liberalism and the threaten, of the, uh, threat, uh, threaten the stability of US-Japan alliance? Maybe. When Prime Minister Abe came back to office in December 2012, two things were clear. One, his priority was economic recovery. Two, he had his nationalist agenda in his mind. On May 23, 2013, the Financial Times writer Philip Stevens wrote a column titled Shinzo Abe Will Not Revive Japan by Rewriting History. He highly evaluated Abenomics and his decision to participate in TPP as a, it is a strategic move in international geopolitics. At the same time, he points out that visiting Yasukuni and bringing patriotism or historical revisionism would simply empower China's insistence that it is not China's expansionism but Jap Japan's nationalism that is raising the tension in Asia. Mr. Stevens argued that economy and security were strategically more important than the history issue. So focus on the most more important issue and kind of forget about less important issue. Overall, you can see the positive evaluation to Prime Minister Abe, mostly based on the management of economy. Although in Japan, you hear nationalists loudly talk about the Yasukuni and the comfort women issues, in the US, we rarely hear these history issues in the discussion about US-Japan uh, relations. 
Considering the big issue of how to manage China, the history issue is much smaller issue than security or economy. And then one time I call um, the uh, article uh, I'm writing for Japanese Public Online Journal, and the saying that you know, I said the history issue, the small issue, and in Japanese it's called Samatsuna Mundai, and it's a tiny, like a trivial issue, which means. And then um, so-called people called like a right-wing, uh, in internet right-wing called Neto Uyo attacked me. Um, <laughs> so it was an interesting experience to handle uh, those comments. So the theme of the Sandster Symposium in November 2012 was a reforms that in Japan, the legacy of Prime Minister Koizumi. As you know, Mr. Abe, last time, so the first term, uh, he succeeded to Koizumi in 2006. And he started his tenure with a very high approval rating thanks to the popularity of Koizumi. He seemed resolved to continue the reforms that Koizumi had started. However, this expect expectation was betrayed soon. Abe and his five prime ministers after him all failed to carry out the reform policies and momentum for the reforms, and then so the momentum for the uh, reforms waned. Now Abe is back. So what is a big issue and what is a small issue is determined by international politics. However, interest groups may change small issue into an important issue in domestic politics. Prime Minister Abe is now tested, I would say, whether he can focus on security and economy while overcoming the rise of nationalism from both his conservative constituencies and from within himself. In that sense, it is Prime Minister Abe. It is Prime Minister Abe's choice whether nationalism contra contradicts the trinity of liberalism and threatens the stability of US-Japan alliance. Now, I would like to invite my colleague of Japanese politics in Texas, uh, Dr. Patricia McRatton uh, of UT Austin, to the podium to take charge of the first panel of the day. I hope you will enjoy the discussion today. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, and my honor to preside as chair and discussant of the per first panel of the session. Um, allow me first to introduce our three speakers. Um, I've decided we should go in the order in which the speakers appear in the schedule, and you'll see that they will um, provide a nice complement to one another. Um, we're going to begin um, with Thomas Berger, who is a professor of international relations at Boston University. Professor Berger received his PhD in political science from MIT, and he is the author of numerous uh, writings on issues relating to international relations, security issues, um, uh, and a number of other topics as well. Let me just mention his uh, most recent um, single authored books, um, and the first one I highly recommend, um, both of them I recommend, but this one's new, hot off the press, um, and speaks very closely to the topics of this, um, this proceeding today. And that is War, Guilt, and World Politics After World War II, and it's published by Cambridge University Press in 2012. He's also the author of Cultures of Anti-Militarism, National Security in Germany and Japan, which reflects his expertise in the comparative politics and foreign policy, not just of Japan, but of Germany as well. So Thomas Berger will set, start things off with a discussion about Abe Shinzo and the politics of history in Japan. Second, um, I'd like to introduce Professor Leonard Schapa, uh, who is a PhD from Oxford University and a professor of politics and the associate dean in the uh, School for Social Sciences at the University of Virginia. Professor Schapa works um, uh, in both comparative politics and IR and has published extensively um, uh, in both fields. He's one of the few people who really do both in many ways. In fact, I would say the same of Professor Berger. Um, and they, I think, are fewer and fewer far between uh, these days. Um, he is the author of numerous edited volumes and articles. Let me introduce his three uh, single authored books. 2006, he was the author of Race for the Exits, The Unraveling of Japan's System for Social Protection. 
Um, before that, in 97, he published Bargaining with Japan, What American Pressure Can and Cannot Do, and his first volume in 1991, published when he must not have been more than 20 years old, was Education Reform in Japan. Um, Dr. Shapa is going to be presenting a piece on his recent work on nationalism entitled The Nationalist's Dilemma, The Politics of, of Nationalism. And then finally, from a somewhat different track, we have a cultural anthropologist, um, Professor Nathaniel Smith, who is now assistant professor of East Asian studies at the University of Arizona. He is a graduate of Yale University, um, and the subject of his dissertation is now um, going to be, it's going to be touched on today, and that was right-wing activism and the politics of futility. And Dr. Dr. Smith has some really eclectic interests, and I want to share some of them with you. Um, not only political anthropology, the history of anthropology, um, and ja modern Japanese history, but he has also done research and is very interested in sound and visual anthropology, music and youth culture, and my favorite, bicycle craftsmen, and I think the next sun and star symposium ought to be on that topic. <laughs> um, Dr. Smith is going to bring things down to the micro level. As a cultural anthropologist, he's going to explore um, and provide us some um, personal history of some of the groups that uh, belong to the uh, so-called right wing in Japan. And so I think he'll, he'll hit that ball home uh, on a more personal note for this very all-important um, panel on Japanese nationalism and the politics of identity. Now, we ask that the speakers um, limit their presentations to 15 minutes each. I'll be the timekeeper, and I'll pass little notes to people who violate that rule. Um, following the presentations, I'll have some, a few brief remarks, but the bulk of the remainder of the session will be left to um, question and answer with, with a whole bunch of us. So I'm very much looking forward to this. Welcome all, and if I could ask Professor Berger to the podium. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Patricia, if I may, um, for that very kind, too kind in my case, uh, introduction. Um, I'd like to just, I'm going to beg for two extra minutes or three extra minutes from the podium, um, from the chair keeper, uh, because um, I also want to, before I talk about the subject which I'm supposed to talk about, which is the history issue, um, one of the central problems um, that we face, I want to talk a little bit more about framing what this conference is about in terms of nationalism and nationalism in Japan. Um, as all of you uh, undoubtedly know, Abe Shinzo is a nationalist. We are told this over and over again, and he himself would say it loud, and he would be very proud to say that he's a nationalist, or at least a patriot, in the Japanese sense. But this, um, at the same time, I've heard there are many others who warn that this kind of nationalism presages, the Abe Shinzo's nationalism presages a more fundamental transformation of Japanese politics, which would have potentially very negative implications for Japanese democracy, for regional relations, and indeed, ultimately, for the U.S.-Japanese relationship. This particular claim is nothing Nothing new. We have periodically expressions of concern that nationalism is about to reemerge in Japan. There's that historical precedent, of course, that uh, everyone recalls, the sort of extreme nationalism of the 1930s and 40s, which after all plunged Japan and the rest of the region into catastrophe. So there, and uh, as uh, th those concerns are very loud, they are, uh, they are periodically reemerge. Um, sometimes they come from uh, voices within Japan often on the left, but not exclusively on the left, to point to various things. Sometimes it comes from people from outside of Japan, currently uh, China, also Korea, but also many other observers. And all of them point often to a range of rather similar types of things and evidence to support their contention. They point to trips to important and controversial sites like Yasukuni, uh, Jinja in Japan. They point to uh, assertiveness on territorial disputes, and we'll be hearing more about that later. They point to increased Japanese defense spending and evidence that Japan's reluctance to become more involved in security issues uh, is now slowly waning away. They point to some of the stunts which are periodically pulled off by far right wingers that Nat will be telling us, as well as about bicycle um, <laughs> repair. Uh, but, you know, I mean, uh, stunts like landing on Senkaku Islands or uh, demonstrations and so forth. So there, if you, there's a whole range of things that are often pointed to as signs, anti foreign movement. Also, I might add, um, uh, is another. Uh, we have a, again, we have, we'll be hearing more about that later. So they point to a whole bunch of um, indicators that suggest that something really fundamentally is changing uh, in Japan. And undoubtedly, uh, something is. But is this very dark picture that they are uh, uh, portraying uh, justified? Well, 
it's easy to cherry pick your data. I mean, if you pick certain pieces of data, you can portray different places, including the United States or any European country, in a broad range of different ways. Um, uh, but what one has to do in this kind of situation is one has to sort of systematically try to piece together different data, to weigh the evidence and to try to come to some kind of balanced conclusion. That's what you do in a court of law. That's what scholars do as well. And so the part of this project is to try to tackle this question from a scholarly perspective, to systematically raise the question of how nationalist is Japan. And one of the first things that strikes one, by the way, is that, you know, sort of like, um, I forget who said, but the reports of Japan, both the reports of Japan's nationalism's reemergence as well as reports of Japan's nationalism's demise, because we also sometimes hear the opposite, that Japan nationalism's disappearing, the sort of lost in translation vision of Japan as this sort of funky post-nationalist uh, utopia or a wasteland, depending on your perspective. These are much exaggerated. There has always been nationalism in Japan. Uh, it is a feature of Japanese politics. And what really is important is the question of how, what kind of shape and form it is taking. And uh, in this project, and you'll be hearing that all through the course of today, you, what we have done is we try to take a look at different aspects of Japanese behavior. Can't look at all of them, but we look at certain domains. Today we're going to be talking about, in this panel, <laughs> today, this panel we're going to be talking about certain aspects of Japanese domestic politics. The politics of history, the politics of politics, how um, uh, nationalism figures in Abe Shinzo and and the LDP's uh, politics in terms of the far right wing. Then later on, we'll be taking a look um, at, uh, at uh, migration as uh, another domain in terms of also how does nationalism manifest itself in terms of Japan's external relations and territorial disputes and its relations with uh, China. So by taking a look at weighing the evidence across a range of domains, we hope to come to a more balanced understanding of what's happening. And as for conclusions, well, I, I guess I'll be up here trying to talk about that later. But I'm just focusing right now on one piece of it, which is um, the piece of how does Japan deal with its history, with its past. Um, this is known in Japanese as the Rekshi Ninchiki Mondai, the problem of historical consciousness. In the State Department, even though usually the State Department does not usually deal with these things in the last few years, they've come to call it as simply the history problem, usually with a kind of sigh and a groan and perhaps even a rolling of eyes, because this is a problem which often from the perspective of Americans, I mean, we have lots of our history problems, but we take a look at this and we, we simply do not understand why there is so much agitation on these questions in East Asia. And often it seems to be clouding the judgment of the participants involved. It leads to uh, uh, exaggerated um, stances and claims being made. Uh, it is causing problems not only between China and Japan, as the ambassador pointed out, uh, Armitage uh, pointed out last night. I mean, one might be able to come up with a logical explanation for why the Chinese pushed that issue, but it also causes problems between two of our, close, our two most close and most important allies in the region, uh, China, uh, Japan and uh, the Republic of Korea, South Korea, which creates enormous headaches. So what's going on? Why is this problem uh, emerging in the way it is? Well, it's difficult for me. This is my life. I mean, recently I've been sort of swallowed up by the history problem. I was originally asked by some of my friends, including friends of mine who are in, in, both in the academy but also in the US government, to look at this since I had been dealing with this stuff earlier. And I said, oh, I can knock this out quickly. You know, this is easy. Well, that was a about 15 years ago, and it sort of swallowed me up. So I've got my own history of the history problem to deal with. But um, I'm trying to be sort of brief. I think the important thing to understand is obviously this problem has its origins in Japanese domestic politics and the particular situation which uh, Japan emerged in Japan at the end of World War II. And there were at least sort of three things coming together. First of all, there was the need of the Allied powers uh, there was the, the interest, the desire, and the allied powers to try to explain to the Japanese that their defeat was not simply a military defeat, but was also a moral defeat. That was important for the Japanese to understand that what they had done was in some ways wrong and needed to be reconsidered. And this was part of a, a very important part of the sort of allied project. It led to the purges. It led to the War Crimes Tribunal, of which the Tokyo War Crimes Tribunal was only the most uh, well-known. And it was a project that was trying to impose upon the Japanese a different understanding, moral understanding, of what it meant to be a member of the international community. In some ways, even though it succeeded in, on one respect, in another respect, it failed fundamentally. 
but I, I'm, I'm happy to talk about that separately. But on the one hand, there was this pressure from the United States and from other allied powers. On the other hand, there was also an internal need for inside of Japan to somehow come to terms with what had just happened. And some of that, I mean, after all, three million Japanese approximately lost their lives. They had lost an empire for the first time in their recorded history. They had been occupied, defeated and occupied by a foreign power. This was an enormous psychic shock. And uh, one of the you know, natural things, what was that all about? How do we justify this to ourselves, to our people? And uh, how do we mourn for the losses? Three million people killed. Not a family in Japan was not affected in some way by these events. How do we also emotionally cope with this? And then the third issue, of course, politics. It, of course, became politicized. Different actors inside of Japanese politics seized upon this issue and tried to use it for their own agenda. Sometimes those, by the way, I mean, that sounds so manipulative. I mean, there were also genuine reasons why people did this. I mean, I don't want to make this purely sort of a negative view of elites, but there you have it. And I think in this context, probably three groups emerged. On the left, and the left was very strong in Japan, and we can't understand by the way Abe thinks about this unless you understand this background. On the left, you had people who said, we want to pursue the question of moral responsibility for the war. The so-called, this became known as the senso sekinin, the war responsibility de uh, debate inside of Japan. We want to use it, we want to pursue it, and we want to go after the people, especially on the right, <laughs> and the conservatives who had been deeply, deeply implicated in various injustices of the war. On the right, of course, on the conservative side, there were many people who were implicated. They said, we, maybe this war was a mistake, but we went into it with good intentions. They wanted to self-justify themselves. They wanted to protect themselves. And they also wanted, at the same time, they, in their minds, uh, they said, we've got to defend ourselves from the left. The left has a whole other agenda, getting Creating, making a disarmed, neutral, socialist Japan, closer to Moscow, closer to Beijing. Now, this is all in the context of the Cold War. Those guys are trying to use this to undermine us and prevent us from rebuilding Japan. So this led then to a, and we therefore need to have a more positive view of post-war Japan. We need to defend this country from its internal enemies as well as external enemies. And this is a spiritual struggle. It is a moral struggle, a political struggle. That's where the Japanese right originally came from in terms of their understanding of this issue. And then, of course, you had a whole bunch of people in between who could agree to some extent with each side. Yeah? I mean, it was very difficult for ordinary Japanese to imagine that their brothers and, sis uh, brothers and, and fathers who had marched off to war had not gone with good intentions. So there was a natural kind of positive reverberation. They sacrificed their lives fighting in the Pacific, fighting in uh, the jungles of Southeast Asia, fighting in China, because and uh, you know, they did this in the best of intentions. I could tell you more about this, but you know, I mean, I've studied this for a long time. It becomes quite emotional. So you know, there's a, they can understand part of the right-wing agenda. At the same time, they're very critical of you know, suspicious of the right. Those guys want to rearm Japan. They want to pull Japan back into a more B big defense, great nation politics, and if you don't watch out, we're going to be doing ten no heka banzai and, and bombing Singapore. Pardon me um, for being sort of flippant about this, but we'll be you know doing we'll be going going down the same terrible crooked path that we went down before, and so you had a real polarization. So you had you know, sympathy with both sides, but the right some of those consensual people. Pragmatic people said, look, we've got other issues, more pragmatic approach. We've got to first obviously deal with the Americans. There are security concerns. We have to rebuild this country. And a lack of enthusiasm for either the grand projects of the left or the right. And I would say that you know, that kind of pattern emerged in early post-war Japan. And that's the sort of framework within which the history issue, questions like Yasukuni, questions like um, uh, what kind of responsibility? That's the, the context in which it emerged in Japan. There was a kind of moratorium, uh, de facto moratorium, uh, pursuing this issue. Now, what also happened, and this became, uh, uh, Len will talk about this more, this issue became very much linked up with another central question of rearmament and national defense in Japan. And uh, the right, basically Japanese defense policy has been pragmatically trying to make minimum adjustments to a series of institutions, the mutual security treaty system and the self-defense forces, in order to basically get a cheap ride. Not a free ride on defense, but try to defend Japan without doing too much. Um, every once in a while that requires changing 
because you have changes in the international politics, every once in a while that requires changes to defense policy. But because of the polarized nature of uh, politics in Japan, because of a level of political paralysis or tendency towards political paralysis that Washington would be proud of <laughs> in the Japanese system, um, it is awfully difficult to push things through. And in that context, what you've seen over and over again is that basically pragmatic, often government officials, but also other members in the broader Japanese political community say we've got to put together a winning coalition. We've got to find other people who will help us be able to push these difficult policies through. And those people traditionally have been on the conservative side, on the right wing of Japanese politics. You saw this already in the 1960s with Kishi, you saw this in the 1980s with Nakasone, you saw this in some ways in the mid-1990s with Hashimoto Ryutaro, for those of you who are versed in sort of the history of Japanese prime ministers, but you see this periodically. And when you have this sort of coalition coming together between pragmatists and uh, right-wing conservatives, one of the things that uh, has to be part of the coalition, part of the bargain between them, is yes, we are going to do the defense issue, but we're also going to have to do something to improve or to uh, strengthen Japanese nationalism. And that often includes history issue. That is, you're going to, uh, and it's again uh, remarkable, almost every time you have moves on Japanese national defense, you also have simultaneously efforts to change the curriculum, educational policy. Why? Because you need to nurture in the young Japanese people a sense of nationalism. Boy Ishiki, those darn leftists, especially the ones in the teachers' union, they've been brainwashing our kids, so they no longer have a sense of self-defense. I was just actually with a Japanese Air Force general, and he was pointing to um, surveys, opinion surveys, which show that, uh, you know, ask Japanese people, if Japan is invaded, what would you do? And, you know, only a small percentage, 10, 12 percent, say we'd, uh, we'd go and fight the enemy. <laughs> Most of uh, plurality say we'll try to help the other side. Large numbers, 20% or so, large percentages will say, well, you know, we'll try to give up, <laughs> surrender. <laughs> and what's, we by the way, what's really upsets, I mean, what's really upsets them is that often if you do this, you, these surveys are done, uh, the dividing the results by age group, often older people are more willing to fight. In fact, one, one of the surveys, it's not every year, showed that like 70-year-old grandmothers are more willing to fight the enemy than 18-year-old young men. <laughs> now, why is that so? Now, okay. I don't, by the way, if Japan were ever invaded, I don't think that would hold up at all. I think that attitudes would change very quickly. But nonetheless, conservatives point to say, and this is an Air Force general I'm talking to, how am I supposed to, you know, this is what we have to work with. We don't have the sort of net, na, the necessary spiritual infrastructure that you need to defend Japan. We need to create boyishki, a sense of national. And so, you know, they want to push these issues through. So you see changes in education. You see move, things like Yasukuni Jinja also have to be understood. Yasukuni Jinja is a site where Japanese fallen soldiers and sailors are commemorated, their spirits are commemorated. And again, conservatives say, how are we going to ask our young people today to possibly put themselves in harm's way if we do not honor the sacrifice made by previous generations? Yeah? I mean, often the comparison that they make is between Arlington National Cemetery and Yasukuni Jinja. Um, with all due respect to the Ambassador Armitage last night, I hope that the American military has never and will not behave the way the Japanese military behaved during World War II. I mean, if you look at the historical record, it's pretty grim. So, you know, you've got to commemorate, you know, you're, you're, there's some difficult moral uh, problems which emerge there. But nonetheless, they argue we've got to do this. And again, you have a natural push, which in the context of Japanese domestic politics is perfectly understandable, to try to increase these issues. Now, there are two problems when you do this in Japan, and Len is going to talk about this in a great deal. There's going to be some problems um, in terms of domestic politics. There's going to be a backlash domestically. The other problem, and this is uh, what I'll sort of point to, is you will also get a pushback internationally. And that pushback on the international side has been increasing over time. It has been increasing in strength, and it's been increasing in potency for a number of long-term historical factors. Um, without talking about those, I mean, for too de much detail, during the 1950s and 60s, uh, even though enormous damage had been done in Southeast Asia and East Asia by Japanese forces during the war, um, 
most countries were willing, with the exception, important exception of South Korea, but most countries were willing to compromise with Japan to forego questions of pursuing questions of historical justice, as pursuing questions of reparations, demanding an apology, and so forth, because they didn't have much leverage vis-a-vis -vis Japan because they had other more pressing goals, fighting internal communist guerrillas, pr uh, promoting economic growth and development, desperately needed Japanese resources. And so this issue was not as much on the political agenda. Also the fact that most of the governments that Japan dealt with in East Asia were not democratic. They were authoritarian dictatorships of one sort or another. Um, also made it easier for these governments to ignore demands for historical justice. That began to change in the 1980s and I know Patricia is getting ready to m move me on, but that began to change in the 1980s um, as you had democratization and as other countries began to develop greater leverage vis-a-vis -vis Japan. It also changed because we had a new discourse on human rights which was emerging globally, and so that helped give a language to those in Japan and Korea, beginning with the comfort women, in other parts of East Asia, including China, former slave laborers, and so forth, in which they could demand that Japan do more in dealing with these issues. Japan and its neighbors managed in the 1980s through the 1990s to deal with this problem more or less. It was, was, a, it was very difficult. Um, it was very surprising to also diplomats who were dealing with it, who, who thought that they, they had settled these issues by the, early, by the late 70s. But it became more difficult. Um, since we've entered into the 21st century, actually the tensions on these issues have reached a new level of magnitude. Um, we have now much more, and it's an ironic, 70 years after the end of World War II, and this year will be interesting to watch. I mean, there's signs, no, it's not in anybody's interest, including I would argue in China's issue, interest to push this issue too far. But nonetheless, we are seeing uh, on the 70th anniversary signs of a lot of new agitation over the history problem. And it has become linked with other issues, most importantly the territorial disputes, which we'll be talking about. And it is beginning to become, uh, and it is also undermining cooperation between, US and, uh, between Japan and South Korea, two countries who out of a whole variety of reasons should be working more closely and in fact need to work more closely, given especially what's happening in the northern part of the Korean Peninsula. So um, uh, the issue has become more pressing, and at the same time, the ability of the political actors and perhaps even the willingness of the political actors is going down. Abe Shinzo, again, we need to change Japanese defense. Japanese defense policy was designed for a different era, there's no question. And in some ways, again, even within Abe's own cabinet, we see people who very much reflect both the traditional conservative, right-wing, nationalist perspective, and also a much more pragmatic uh, stream. And there's a battle going on inside the cabinet. And one of the central things is Abe's going to have to make a speech on his 70th anniversary. He's going to have to say something come August this year on this issue. And the question is, what is he going to say? How are we going to frame it? And uh, there is a, a real, uh, as far as I can uh, judge, a real fight going on among Abe's uh, advisors trying to define what is being said. Um, I won't go into those details here. But, um, and, uh, but we're seeing those same, same types of tensions coming up and they're, going to and they're increasing. Now, what does this mean? Well, uh, I don't know. If you follow the past pattern, whenever you go too far, the coalition between the right and the left between, or between, excuse me, the right and the center, between conservatives and pragmatists, begins to dissolve. That's a real danger, by the way, for the Abe administration. In some ways, his first administration fell apart <laughs> over this issue when he went too far in pushing constitutional revision, which is another one of the issues that they uh, talk about. I don't know if that will happen this time. You know, history repeats itself, as Mark Twain says, but it rhymes. Things may go differently, and the rhyme may, may end up on a more discordant note than it has in the past. I wouldn't be happy, by the way, if Abe, I hope Abe succeeds for a whole variety of reasons, um, uh, but um, uh, that could happen in terms of domestic politics. It also can lead to some very nasty tensions in East Asia. How does that affect the U.S.? Well, the one thing which I want to say is that the U.S. is deeply involved in this. We have an interest, as the Ambassador Armikos pointed out last night, in seeing Japan succeed. It's, uh, we need a stable Japan, a strong Japan. Um, but it also, one of the things that historically the U.S. has done is avoided the history issue. We have never felt that this is an issue, at least on a diplomatic level, that really it benefits us to get involved in. Um, 
begin with, we don't have clean hands, right? People in the region, Filipinos will point to the counterinsurgency campaign in which 200,000 Filipinos were killed during the, in the late 19th century. Uh, Vietnamese have a whole set of issues they could raise. The Japanese could point out, well, what about Hiroshima, Nagasaki? Shouldn't we get an apology for that? Um, since you're asking us to apologize for a whole range of different things. The South Koreans as uh, talk about the Taft Katsura Agreement or no gunry and other unfortunate incidents during uh, the Korean War. So you could get a whole mess, right, if we pull, push ourselves. And also, if we try to mediate, will certainly piss off somebody. <laughs> there will be people on, we will be, and we basically want, if there's going to be some kind of discussion or reconciliation, the Asian leaders have to take credit for it. They have to own that issue. That is something that they have to, has to come from them. It shouldn't be imposed or be, look as if it were imposed by us. And uh, we will, otherwise, they won't live up to it, and uh, people on, the, on both sides will blame us. So no reason we want to do it. But nonetheless, we are under pressure now given this reality of this increasing salience of the history issue, we're under pressure to encourage the Asian countries, including Japan, Korea, and China, to find a, a stronger solution of that issue. So that's what's going on with the history issue in a nutshell. I've used up all my time, so I uh, look forward to your comments. It's hard to do that subtly. Um, so I'm, I'm going to pick up uh, largely where Tom left off by focusing a little bit more uh, closely on some particular episodes in the story of Japanese nationalism in the post-war period. Um, the, the, uh, I think a, a, a way to think about the way, I, as, you, as, you can, as you may know, the, the uh, title of the paper that I'm presenting today is called The Nationalist Dilemma. And I think it's useful to think about the framework I'm using in comparison with a pretty well-known argument in international relations theory, which um, looks at the example of Nixon going to China to um, improve relations between the United States and China after a long period of, of hostility, and says that only somebody like Nixon, somebody who's a hawk, who was known to be tough on the communists, could um, bring home a agreement that involved mending relations with China and get the Congress and the American public to accept the move towards peace. Okay? So if you contrast that with what's in the news lately with Obama trying to bring home an agreement on Iran, uh, we see that, the, that a, somebody who has more of a dovish reputation um, can't do that as easily. Um, some, if Obama brings home an agreement on Iran that doesn't look um, convincing enough, he's going to have a lot of people who aren't going to trust him to move the United States towards rapprochement with, with Iran. So in Japan, in many ways, is dealing with the opposite challenge. How do we go from the Yoshida Doctrine, where Japan is committed to pacifism, a limited role for defense, um, a moderate security policy, to a more assertive national security posture where Japan's going to do more with its military, it's going to defend itself, it's going to move in what we're using in the shorthand here in a nationalist direction. And um, what, what I'm suggesting in, in the case series of cases that I look at today is that in the same way that it takes, a, perhaps it takes a Nixon to go to China, it might take a moderate to move Japan um, in the kind of direction that Nakas that uh, that uh, the series of nationalists in Japan have wanted to take it. And when you have instead have the, pull, the mirror image of Obama, somebody with a hawkish reputation, like Kishi or Nakasone or Abe, trying to move Japan in that direction, they run into all these kinds of trust problems. People don't quite trust them to lead Japan in a more assertive direction. They get all worried and they pull back. And so that's the essential nationalist dilemma, is the people in Japanese politics who've really wanted to move Japan in that direction have run into a backlash every time they've tried to do it. So um, the, the paper looks at these series of episodes, and I argue that there's a pretty consistent um, agenda that each of these nationalist prime ministers has, have had. They've tried to do very similar things each time, so they make a nice comparison of episodes. Um, all these people fall in the same lineage, and by that, um, in, in some cases, we mean literal 
uh, genetic lineage. Um, Abe is the grandson of Kishi, so we have two people um, from the same genetic lineage involved in this, but there's a recognizable nationalist lineage of politicians that doesn't just involve being related to each other. Um, and somebody like Nakasone fits easily in that, in that line. Um, all of these people have pursued the following four goals. This is what I mean by nationalism. They reject the view that Japan alone was, blamed, was to blame for the war in the Asia Pacific. They feel the war crime trials were victor's justice that unfairly implied that Japan was the only nation to commit atrocities during the war. They do not feel that it was right for the United States to saddle Japan with a constitution permanently limiting the nation's ability to defend itself. They do not feel Japan should have to apologize continuously for its wartime behavior or that it should have to forego honoring those who died fighting for the nation. Instead of apologizing and limiting its role in world affairs, they argue Japan should throw off the shackles of Article 9 and defeatism and proactively provide for its own security. So that, in a nutshell, is exactly what Kishi was trying to do in the 1950s leading up to 1960. Um, it's what Nakasone was trying to do in the 80s, um, and it is what Abe has tried to do twice. First, when he was involved with the Koizumi administration and then became um, the prime minister himself in, in the early 2000s, and again now that, that he's the prime minister. Now, the, my particular paper focuses primarily on those earlier episodes, because to see the backlash, you've got to see the whole episode. We don't know um, how uh, Abe's latest episode is going to turn out. He's only been at this since he visited Yasukuni Shrine in 2013. That first year of his prime ministership, he focused on Abenomics. He uh, delivered to the Japanese public what he promised he would do. He would focus on economic growth first. But exactly a year after he came into office, he started um, pursuing a more nationalist agenda. And at the end of my talk, if I don't run out of time, I will come back and look briefly at Abe's episode. And um, so let me start by summarizing what I see as the, the, the pattern that's been repeated in each of these episodes, the backlash pattern. Um, this is largely a product, I should point out, I don't think that every country faces a nationalist dilemma. It's largely a product of Japan's unique history some of which you heard from, from Tom, that has left a substantial portion of the population in Japan and many of Japan's neighbors very suspicious of any moves to adopt a more, even normal, security policy. It's seen as a possible return to Japan's aggression um, leading up to World War II. So in that particular historical context, what you have is um, any attempt by the, the, the uh, hawkish leaders to move Japan in that direction, encounters a, a resistance from certainly the left, the socialists that you heard about from Tom, uh, also from the moderates inside the LDP. Uh, every time one of the more nationalist prime ministers has tried to move Japan in that direction, you've had somebody from the Yoshida lineage, the other important lineage in the LDP politics, that's tried to pull them back. Yoshida, Ikeda, Sato, Miyazawa, um, Gotoda, these people have each time tried to pull Japan uh, back away from the, from the more nationalist direction. Um, and then you have the neighbors that we already started hearing about from, from, from Tom, uh, pulling, uh, also insisting that Japan pull back from that direction. So when, when a nationalist prime minister encounters this, the typical reaction has been to rely on United States pressure. How can you get the moderates in the LDP to go along with some movement in the nationalist direction? You have to frame it as we need to do this for the US alliance. The Americans are talking about burden sharing. The Americans need our help. If we depend on them, we have to keep them happy. So let's move in, in the direction of doing more in national security in order to please um, the United States. And each time, I argue this fosters an inherent uh, kind of a dissatisfaction among the hardcore nationalists in Japan. That their whole purpose is to try to get Japan to provide for its own defense, for its own purposes, to be able to have more autonomy from the United States so that it doesn't depend so much on the United States. 
So having to rely on US pressure to move in the direction they want to go makes them inherent, uh, inherently frustrated. And so they, they tend to accompany these efforts to move Japan in this direction in security policy with what I call uh, in-your-face nationalist acts. Okay? Things that the United States is not asking them to do. The um, United States is not asking the prime ministers to visit Yasukuni Shrine. We're not asking them to um, put, put a, a water down the accounts of history in textbooks. Um, we're not asking them to uh, re revisit the apology, the Kono apology, so um, for, on the comfort women issue. In fact, the United States is quietly um, cautioning the Jap Japanese nationalist prime ministers, don't do those things. So they, but this makes them all the more eager to do some of these things just to show that we are nationalists. We are no longer um, the junior dependent partner. Uh, we can do these things by ourselves. They want to build that pride in the country that you heard about that they're worried the young generation doesn't have. Uh, how can you build pride if all, every time you move security policy in a little bit of a nationalist direction, you're saying we have to do it because Americans told us to do it um, instead of we're doing this out of our own national interest. So um, the, the, the argument is that this, this, the tendencies of the, the particular historical context in which Japanese nationalists operate have produced uh, backlashes when they've done this, these in-your-face acts. That makes the moderates even more nervous. It makes the neighbors extremely nervous. And everybody tries to pull back the nationalist prime ministers. As soon as they leave office, um, many of the steps in the more nationalist direction are rolled back, and the nationalists fail to achieve their goals. That's their essential dilemma. So the body of the paper looks at these three um, earlier episodes, um, Kishi, Nakasone, and the first Koizumi Abe uh, period, and, and finds a similar story to what I just described. And then at the end, because I probably will run out of time, I'm going to summarize my argument on, um, on how I see things possibly paying, playing out differently with Abe. My, my, uh, the, the basic dynamics that I described suggest that there's two ways to move Japan's policy in a more normal nation's security policy direction. One is have to have a moderate do it. We do have some examples of that. Uh, Prime Minister Miyazawa, who was from the Yoshida lineage was the person who pushed through the peacekeeping operation laws that for the first time sent Japanese soldiers to, to Cambodia, sent Japanese soldiers as part of peacekeeping missions overseas. That was an important step in the early 1990s. And when, it, when Miyazawa led it, it was, went through without a huge international backlash, without the moderates pulling it back. He was the moderate. So um, possibly, Japan could move in that direction again with another moderate. The problem is there's not another moderate on this horizon. Uh, there are a lot fewer moderates in the LDP today. Um, most of that Yoshida lineage has, has retired or passed away. And um, Abe himself is going to be with us for a while, and he doesn't look like a moderate. So he would have a lot of trouble convincing anybody he was a moderate. So the, um, the moderate way out of the nationalist dilemma doesn't seem to be available to Japan now. The other one that I think not, Abe might be recognizing is that to, this latest episode is taking place in a different international context in which the United States is not pushing so much for Japan to burden share. The earlier ones, remember when Nakasone was pushing, Reagan was, was uh, the president and was pushing Japan as an ally to fight the Cold War against the Soviet Union. Um, in that particular moment when uh, the West was once again uh, reorganizing to take on the communist challenge. That was a moment that made a lot of moderates nervous. Do we really want to be sucked into a Cold War conflict? We need to make sure that uh, we don't get um, entrapped in some American aggressive war. Similar story with Kishi. Kishi was um, acting during the period in which Kimoi and Matsu were being shelled by the Chinese and the American Navy was going in to the Taiwan Strait. Um, he was pushing his agenda when, when the uh, U-2 incident took place. And we learned that U-2 flights were, were being flown out of Japan, possibly putting Japan at risk at, in World War III. So in those kinds of international contexts, the, um, 
there was there was there was a, a strong tendency of moderates of a reason for moderates in Japan to worry that a hawkish prime minister moving Japan's policy in that direction will put the country at risk. Today, Obama is not the one pushing Abe to take steps in a, a normal nation direction. Quietly, Japanese, I mean, American diplomats have for many years been encouraging the Japanese to uh, revise their, inter reinterpret the Constitution, reinterpret the Constitution to allow for collective self-defense that would allow Japan to do more roles and missions in cooperation with the United States. So it's not that American pressure is, is absent. We do have wanted Abe to do the things he has lately been doing on national security policy, but we haven't been openly and publicly demanding it, calling for burden sharing, um, and making it a gaiatsu kind of thing. So Abe has been able to take these steps himself, as this is Japan's national interest, we face a threat from China, we need to do these things for ourselves, and not having to worry about doing it under the cover of the gaiatsu, um, arguably allows um, him to avoid doing the in-your-face things. He doesn't need to go to Yasukuni. He doesn't need to revise historical memory and, and, and reissue, make public speeches that question the comfort women um, narrative of, of, uh, that's coming from the Koreans and the Japanese left. He doesn't need to do these things to show that he's got Japanese pride. And so th this is another way, possibly out of the nationalist dilemma that my, my paper uh, presents. This is only a hypothesis that's looking towards the future. We don't know if Abe will actually tr try that course, right? Because in, starting in December 2013, he um, decided to visit, surprised many people by visiting Yasukuni Shrine um, and provoking huge protests from the Koreans and the Chinese. And then in the spring of 2014, he um, instructed his cabinet to re review the, the Kono apology for the comfort women and to, to, to re-examine the evidence to see if it, that apology was really justified. That was a huge um, provocative thing for him to do. So, you know, I don't know what Abe is going to do, but maybe if he really wants to move Japan in, in this national security, normal nation direction, he will have realized the lessons of history that I describe in my paper and realized that if he wants to escape from the national dilemma, nationalist dilemma, he needs to forego any further visits to Yasukuni, um, any attempt to, to back away from the Kono apology or make some provocative historical statements on the 70th anniversary of the war. If he can forego all that, if he can have some self-restraint of some of his impulses, um, he may be able to escape from this dilemma this time and move Japan in the direction that, that he wants to go. So um, rather than, since I, I re going into the, the episodes that are described in the, in the paper involving Kishi and uh, Nakasone and the earlier Abe in any detail, I thought I'd just give you the overall sketch of my paper and invite you to ask some questions if you want to hear more about these periods. Thank you. timer now. <clears throat> um, so I'm an anthropologist by training, I'm not a political scientist, and since <clears throat> 2005 I've been doing work on Japanese right-wing street activism. Um, so if people say, what about nationalism in Japan, oftentimes if you've ever been to Japan, you have an image of the sound trucks, these big decommissioned vans and buses, armored vehicles, parked out in front of train stations, uh, involved in street oratory, sometimes demonstration marches. Um, Japanese history is pockmarked with instances of intimidation and violence, assassination, uh, and so forth. Um, but that's sort of a, a discussion that I, I deal with in my broader work. Today what I'd like to talk about is the way that even though when we talk about what rightist activism means, it's really an instable 
uh, an unstable form. It's really sort of a uh, dynamic form. And oftentimes, the way that that form has changed over the past several decades has been about changes in the interlocutors. Uh, say, the dissolution of the left, uh, changes in Japan's position vis-a-vis -vis the United States, uh, new forms of domestic nationalism that put the previously existing right-wing groups on a different footing, right? So I want to talk about that um, readjustment. Sometimes it's <clears throat> strategic, sometimes it's circumstantial. Sometimes it's a, an end of the Cold War story. Sometimes it's a, what do we do in this new uh, post-311 nuclear environment uh, that Japan is faced with now? So generally, though, the main point is I want us to think about sort of the fluidity and the instability and how the right can actually uh, shift in ways that we perhaps don't expect. It could be dynamic. It could be potentially uh, problematic. But uh, it comes back to the way that these groups, who have for a long time seen themselves as outsiders in politics, um, now vested with a prime minister who's taking a more nationalist path and doing it relatively effectively, do they find themselves part of that constituency or do they want to define themselves as still against it, right? Do they still sort of want to scream from the margins or do they feel like they're in some ways more invested than they used to be? Um, just to give you an example of the, of the, the flexibility, this is a, sh a shot of, of groups lined up um, in the precincts of Yasukuni Shrine. Uh, after sort of topping up their, their spiritual and historical background um, before going out to protest against the, uh, the Office of the North Korean um, Residents Association uh, and various other embassies. But to give you a sense of the flexibility, on the one hand, we have groups like Isuikai. So Isuikai is sort of the standard bearer group for the new right. These are groups that came out in the early 1970s uh, in reaction partially to the uh, protest suicide of Yukio Mishima at the self-defense headquarters in, Ich in Ichigaya, but also in reaction to the left and the student movements in Japanese university campuses um, in the late 60s and early 70s. So the, the new right, as exemplified by Isikai, uh, values ethnic self-determination, um, values independence from the United States, is very explicitly um, anti-American in the context of um, Japan's defense, uh, but also in the context of US imperialism around the world. So when we came to the first Gulf War, um, the leader of Isikai, in, at that point, in, in the blue um, jacket there, was very public about uh, denouncing US imperialism uh, in, in trying to push Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait. And during sort of the, the decade of sanctions that followed, um, put his money where his mouth was and helped to uh, uh, sort of not evade sanctions, but um, help the, the Ba'athist uh, sort of maintain their space uh, by go donating water purifiers, donating air conditioners, um, creating links to uh, Iraq under occupation. By the time we came to the second Gulf War, um, I think he had a lot more uh, support within Japan for that position. So groups like Isikai could be contrasted with groups like the Dainippon Aikokuto, this is sort of one, of the, one of the classic uh, early post-war uh, rightist groups. And this is a shot from um, the diary sort of photo album of one of the members uh, at, the, at the eve of the first um, Iraq war. And you, mean, you can read the banners for yourselves. But they were taking a very uh, stridently pro-American tack. So even within the right and groups that are involved in the same sort of activist practices, they're, they're diverging, um, uh, we missed something? Um, diverging angles that they would take vis-a-vis -vis the United States and vis-a-vis -vis domestic politics. So what I wanted to do is give you, um, in the remainder of my time, uh, a tour through two individuals who've both weathered very significant changes um, between the period of the first Abe administration, which is when I was initially doing my fieldwork, and, and now. Um, and I think it'll help flesh out what it, we mean when we say that nationalism in Japan is a many and varied thing um, in a way that uh, I think resonates for people on the street. Uh, it, it can be something that is potentially useful for Abe or potentially undermining for Abe. And it's something that necessarily uh, can't be planned for. So um, this young gentleman here, Yamaguchi Yujiro, um, was well, at this point a newspaper delivery boy. He uh, ended up becoming a rightist activist by chance. He was listening to one of these street oratory sessions in front of Shinjuku Station. The boss of the group, who I'll introduce you to in just a moment, noticed him and said, do you have any questions? Would you like to you know, talk with me about stuff? I saw you there for two hours listening to us. Yamaguchi was out of work. He dropped out of music school. And he said, was kind of shy. The boss gave him some uh, pamphlets and said, come back next week if you're interested. Yamaguchi came back. And the boss said, so what did you think? Yamaguchi started to tell him. And the boss said, OK, if you, are, if you have some thoughts, then here's a microphone. Um, tell everybody in front of Shinjuku Station, the most busy train station in the world. 
So Yamaguchi was sort of thrust into this, and yet he found some sort of footing. He was at this point 20, 21 years old, and he was kind of ambiguous on the microphone. I actually have a clip. Um, he um, isn't sort of the full-throated nationalist you would expect, and yet the group was able to sort of give him a, a place to have a voice. え、I love his moment of self-reflexivity, right? <laughs> um, so he was, he was sort of a, 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 weird, a weird figure, right? There he is with his megaphone. He's standing right in front of an area that's uh, a red light district. So these guys in the foreground are scouts. They're trying to get girls to come to their clubs and to be sort of buttered up with drinks and leave with heavy debt. Um, they're trying to get girls to work in, in uh, the sex industry. And so Yamaguchi is there talking to these people, right? And he's talking in the, in the idiom of a young person who's not sort of stridently politically one way or the other necessarily. Um, he was written up early in his career as the host-faced new rightist for his penchant for wearing shiny suits and having feathered hair. Um, and he was contrasted with sort of the jackbooted thug that you can see over there, Kanetomo, um, who's actually still a very active guy. So these were the sort of the new generation, right? We've got the smooth talker and we've got sort of the hardcore what you would expect of a fascist or something like that. Um, but he studied, right? That's the leader of his group that I'll introduce you in just a moment. Um, he studied, he got, he got better. He started to uh, figure out how he could actually speak about the imperial institution, which was a very hard thing for him to do at the beginning because his parents were both um, juku, cram school teachers, and very, very left wing in his telling of it. Um, but uh, over you know, six or seven months or so of Yamaguchi coming onto the scene and, and sort of you know, getting his bona fides, um, something happened. You know, he, he developed a political sensibility, and in fact, um, he uh, committed a pretty interesting act. So some of you may recall in 2007 that the defense minister at the time, Kuma, um, said that the atomic bombings of Japan uh, were shoganai, that they couldn't be helped. Uh, basically sort of the, the US line that this uh, sped the end of the war and it kept the Russians from coming in and this type of thing. And he said that to a relatively closed audience, but it was reported widely. And in reaction to that, um, Yamaguchi, um, the leader of his group there sitting on the right and the senior member sitting on the left, Yamaguchi, uh, with a lit Molotov cocktail, went through the gates of the defense ministry after midnight, um, July 26th. It was right when I was coming back to the States for two weeks, and I thought, oh, man, I've got to get back. Um, luckily, uh, you can't see anybody for the first two weeks after you're arrested, so uh, I was able to visit him in jail and go to uh, his, his trial and such. But he had a, uh, a small knife with him in, the, in his backpack, in addition to another Molotov. And the prosecutors were trying to make the case that he intended to, arm, to, to harm the guards. And so they were charging him with that as well. And he said, no, 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 in front of you know, his parents and his brother and everybody else that was in the, the, the galley, um, that he intended to do what Mishima had done in 1970 and kill himself. But he didn't know if he could um, uh, go through with it. <clears throat> so he got a suspended sentence, um, went back to Gunma, and a few months later came back. This is the leader of his group there at the same spot outside of Shinjuku Station. Can anybody guess where Yamaguchi is? in the silver suit. He came back as a host, um, trying to get girls to come to his club. Um, uh, um, some years, or, or some months later, however, he gave up with that and started working again as an activist. Um, so we'll come back to Yamaguchi later, uh, but I want to transition now to talk about Haria. So Haria is the leader of the group that Yamaguchi was a part of. Um, it is called the Toitsu Sensei Gyugun, or the United Front Volunteers Army. Um, you might have noticed the helmet and the towel is sort of a left-wing uh, affectation in Japan. That's because the Gyugun sees itself, even the name is sort of uh, heady and sounds like a, a, a Chinese slogan in a way. Um, the, the Gyugun saw itself as the militarized uh, foot soldiers of the new right. So they were um, actively not aligned with organized crime, like many rightist groups in Japan are. Um, 
Hadia himself, the leader of the group, uh, is a taxi driver and works insane hours in order to sort of run away on the weekends and be involved as an activist. Um, they're anti-American, anti-base. Uh, they appropriated the guerrilla tactics of the left. And so part of their playing with these visuals is to muddy those waters of, of political alignment. Um, here are a couple shots of Gugan. These are from the 80s. But one of the, the main protests that they do is each year going to Yokosuka. And on the day that every other rightist group is protesting the Russians for taking the northern territories, Gugan is protesting the Americans in front of the Yokosuka base for dropping the bomb on Nagasaki. Um, and in the, con in the context of doing so, they usually try to find, or, or sometimes they are found by, uh, uh, random servicemen and get into an altercation. So these, these images are all from their website. Um, and I was often warned by Hadia when I was hanging out with groups of, of their activists that I hadn't had a good relationship with, which person is more or less likely to try to beat me up. And, and I, would <laughs> I would stick with them so that, so that I, I you know, wouldn't be an unknown quantity. Um, so let's go to 311, right? So this is sort of the Giyugun as they existed. 311, um, there was a, a spontaneous set of protests that happened in sort of counterculture areas in, in Tokyo, in the Koenji area, people that had involved in um, anarchist and leftist and sort of uh, uh, not non-aligned, but still sort of more progressive type movements. Hadia was approached by uh, one of the leaders of the groups based in Koenji and asked to participate. Um, in this sort of anti-nuclear demonstration, partially because they respected his stance as being non-aligned and anti-American. Um, other people that had been invited said, no, we don't want a rightist here in our anti-nuclear march. That's not what we do. And so Hadia, in response to that, um, started his own um, series of demonstrations and info sessions and later published this book called Escaping the Nuclear State from the Right. Um, what does that mean? Uh, inside the book, he gives sort of details on how you organize a nuclear demonstration. If the idea is that the anti-nuclear movement was something that was the purview of the left, he was saying that, no, the right cannot relinquish that, right? Um, if we think about uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima, that was something that was levied upon all Japanese citizens. If we think about sort of the failures of the nuclear state, that's something that all Japanese citizens have to deal with. So why shouldn't the right be allowed to have their own anti-nuclear movement? So within the book, I'll just go through these. It says how to organize a march, how to get uh, a, approval to do it, what you should bring, how you promote it, um, how to bring sort of a hand, uh, a megaphone, and how to get approval from the police to have a march. It's basically a primer in how to in participate in activism. Um, but the most important point, though, I think, in this escaping the nuclear state from the right was his distinction between the flag of the state versus the citizen's flag. And this isn't the easy distinction of the minzokuha, the ethnic nationalists do this, but the kokumin people do this, the, the people who are concerned with juridical citizenship do this, where the ethnic nationalists do the other. This muddies the water. And basically, uh, he's saying that he's making a move against the left, right? He's also making a move against the right. He's saying that if you're a conservative Japanese politician, you can't say this is only a left-wing issue. This is a right-wing issue as well, so you have to respond, right? Which I think was something that was pretty powerful. So um, in my last two-ish minutes. I want to jump to uh, sort of the, the rise of another kind of rightist movement in Japan that I think we'll hear about a little bit later in the day. Uh, many of you may be familiar with the Zaitoku Kai. Zai Kai. Uh, it's a citizens group that will not forgive special privileges for Korean residents of Japan. It's kind of like a Japan Tea Party. It came out of internet organizing. It's very harshly um, anti-Korean and anti-Chinese. Um, and on the one hand, it's uh, reacting to sort of the Korea boom in the 2000s, in the early 2000s in Japan, and then this backlash. On the other hand, it's reacting to South Korean nationalism. And here's a South Korean activist eating a Japanese flag. Um, so <laughs> it's, it's not happening in a vacuum, right? So then the question is, how do the right-wing groups that existed beforehand interact with groups like this that are stridently anti-Korean? One of the quick responses uh, that I always got was, uh, we hate the communist Chinese, but we don't hate the Chinese people. Right? Um, we hate the North Korean commies. We hate the South Korean for having their false democracy, but we don't hate Koreans as such, partially because of this post-war history. And there are a lot of ethnic Koreans, particularly in the Kansai area, that are involved in rightist activism to the extent that it's aligned with organized crime. Um, so this is a uh, demonstration mar march that was staged just north of that red light district, Kabukicho. Um, was going to march right through Okubo, this ethnic Korean enclave, um, in the summer two years ago. And inside the gates of this park are about 500 or so demonstrators. Um, outside are police and uh, uh, a whole host of, of agents from NPA. There were, the reason I was able to get there was because the, the boss for Sumi Yoshikai for this area is also involved in uh, right-wing activism. 
And he was there sort of watching all of these anti-Korean protesters walk in. And what he said to one of the leaders of the anti-Korean protesters was not, I, I don't think that you should be racist. He said, you're disturbing business. And I asked him about that afterwards. And he said, well, as my role as the leader of this organized criminal syndicate in this area, that's what's going to make something meaningful for him. right?" Um, so here we are. Outside of these barricades, this is an interesting development. Outside of these barricades around the park were thousands upon thousands upon thousands of counter demonstrators protesting against this anti-Korean group. As we, I marched out with the group, <laughs> the anti-Korean group, partially because that was the only way I could get out. Um, that's another long story. People accosted me later. Um, but as we, we rounded the, the barricades out onto the main streets, you see something like this. Show racism, the red card, um, the cordons of riot police holding back the counter demonstrators. And this was a, a, a movement that sprung up because these anti-Korean groups had targeted anti-nuclear groups. And suddenly the anti-nuclear groups knew that there were these uh, anti-Korean groups and what they were doing and decided that this is not something that we can have stand in, in Japan now. Um, but I'll give you a little hint of what they're screaming at them. It's discrimination. So there's this idea of, of uh, sort of false equivalencies that's, that's really kind of strange. But the reason why I bring this up is uh, for who shall I <laughs> Yamaguchi was there with a megaphone slung over his shoulder, marching along the entire course of their demonstration march, screaming at them. And he's been one of the people that's been very central in the, the group that was created called Racist Oshibakitai, or I Want to Beat Back the Racist Core, uh, known as the Shibakitai. So uh, I'm, I'm at time, but basically over that course of the first Abe administration to the second, uh, both Haria, the leader of this very stridently anti-American group who suddenly found a voice in terms of anti-nuclear mobilizations against the Japanese state, right? And Yamaguchi himself, who's moved from explicitly right-wing activism to explicitly anti-racist activism being his, his main day-to-day -day set of commitments, um, I think tells us something about both the flexibility of these kinds of movements, but also potentially their volatility. And so we can't really think about um, sort of nationalism in Japan uh, in a way that, that is that doesn't sort of pay justice or pay attention to that kind of unevenness. So I'll leave it at that and thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Those were three very interesting and sometimes provocating, provocative um, discussions of nationalism. Um, allow me to make just a few broad comments, some of which are designed to wrap up some of the themes or tie together some of the themes um, of this session. And I also want to inject a little bit of my own opinion, if I may, um, hopefully in a way that will spark some, uh, some more conversation. Um, I can't help but sit through any session on nationalism or read any paper on nationalism without plugging it into that major theme that's been so prominent in uh, Japan over the past generation, which is Japan's effort to become a more normal nation. Um, this is something that is widely discussed in varying degrees um, throughout Japanese society, and it's a very, very controversial issue. Um, and personally, I agree with um, Tom's comment that why shouldn't they be a normal nation? Uh, that the, the, the post-war settlement was a reflection of a very distinctive and odd period in Japanese history. Japan is a much different country. Perhaps it is time for them to rethink their, their defense policy and move in different directions. All right. 
Now, there could not be a more controversial set of issues, of course, confronting Japan today. And I think our panelists have really highlighted the complexities in dealing with this issue head on. Um, we have seen how nationalism, uh, or not nationalism, but the return to normalcy um, is affected by uh, a lack of consensus at home as to what normalcy actually means. Um, and I think Nat's piece really um, hits that home for us. Uh, with his discussion, very pro interesting discussion, about the flexibility and diversity within the right-wing movement, particularly amongst small um, right-wing organizations. And if I can just break off for a moment and pose a couple of questions for Nat, um, which he may address at any pr point during Q&A. And that is, uh, and I appreciate that th these are two groups that change with the times, the individuals change. Um, their goals change, um, but to what extent might we talk of a movement? Are there, how many groups are like them? Um, are they an anomaly or are they representative or are there part patterns within this, this right-wing movement? What can we say about what defines it, if anything at all? I was a little bit unclear about that and I, I would love to hear a little bit more from his field work. Um, along that same, those same lines, um, I'd be very interested in his views and his observations about uh, the extent to which some of these groups are moving toward violence. Is this a major feature of these groups? Is it something that ebbs and flows? So what are the patterns of violence amongst these right-wing groups? And then finally, in bringing it back to the present and, and some of the political issues at hand, um, how many of these groups support Abe? And to what extent does Abe look to these groups himself for support as he pushes his nationalist agenda? Or are they too far right on the right-wing nationalist fringe for them to be of political use to those who might consider themselves uh, more moderate right-wing nationalists? Um, so that was the first set of issues that I really uh, feel affects, I think this come, come through in these discussions, that really affects um, Japan's movement toward becoming a more normal nation. Um, the second is, of course, the international public opinion issues, um, the prospects of an international backlash whenever Japan stands up and visits Yasukuni Shrine or talks about those textbooks or revises history in any way, um, brings up the issue of the comfort women. Those uh, We didn't discuss it too much in this particular panel, but I think we're all aware that this is a major impediment to Japan's room to maneuver in defining its own way forward toward normalcy. And then finally, and this I think touches on both papers, the first two papers, and particularly Lens, um, uh, the, the issue of domestic political strategies and how complex they have become. And I was particularly struck by Lens' comments, and this comes up in uh, Tom's paper as well, about how there are patterns in nationalist efforts to confront some of these issues and redefine Japan's future. Um, there's a movement toward normalcy, um, <clears throat> toward a more robust defense policy, if you will, in ways that are usually couched in rhetoric about the necessity of shoring up the U.S.-Japan relationship to some degree. Um, and then Len pointed out that there's always this rever reverberation to discussing those in-your-face nationalist issues like visiting Yasukuni and discussing or bringing up the comfort women and how it shouldn't be an issue anymore and so on and so forth. We're all familiar with what's on that list of um, very provocative topics. And I see a linkage between Len's observations there and Tom's very interesting comments in his discussion with the, uh, I think, I believe it was an Air Force captain, how Japan doesn't have the spiritual framework in order to uh, enable Japan to move forward and create a more normal defense policy or a more normal sense of patriotism within the country. Uh, and I think it, this is the crux of the problem. It seems that uh, so many who do define the the rhetoric towards uh, building a more normal Japan tend to also have an agenda that should de they feel should define the, the spiritual foundations of Japan. So I'd like to ask, just in closing, and I'd like your opinions and those of the, the floor, to what extent is it really necessary for Japan to begin with nationalism, uh, with the, that spiritual foundation first? Can't we brush that under the carpet? Or do those issues need to be confronted before we actually move forward um, in discussing a new defense policy for Japan in the future? 
Um, so those are some questions that I want to throw out in the, uh, uh, for, for discussion in addition to what's been raised today. And then to close, let me just say that I think like many people here, I have very strongly ambivalent feel, feelings about President Abe, Prime Minister Abe Shinzo. On the one hand, um, from, coming from my own research interests, I have great admiration from, for him. I am currently studying uh, agricultural reform in Japan. And I must say, in doing the research and looking at some of the policy changes before Japan as we speak, Abe has probably done more than Koizumi, uh, and certainly compared to the, the prime ministers who preceded him, the last five prime ministers, to change the political economic structure of Japan in ways that most of us agree are good for the long-term health and prosperity of the country. Uh, and I would even suggest that if he gets his way on his agenda, he could actually accomplish more in terms of structural reform than Koizumi ever did. He plays by a different playbook. He is not as confrontational. He's not willing to put his government on the line for the sake of reform. Uh, and he certainly play, uh, does not, is not willing to play hardball in elections to get his way in reform. But he certainly is making progress in very remarkable ways. But on the other hand, um, and I know I'm walking on very, in very sensitive issues here. Um, whenever he brings up that comfort women issue, I really cringe. Uh, and it, and it's, it's, a, it's a very, very difficult issue. I understand and I understand the, the complexities of it. But also it really does rub uh, Asian sensibilities the wrong way. And it does strike many people as offensive. Um, perhaps if he did simply stop talking about it. Maybe he would make some of his, uh, uh, achieve some of his goals on the nationalist front. And then finally, just one last question. Um, both Tom and, and Len spoke at length about some of the patterns of uh, moving toward normalcy, et cetera. And I noticed in, in Tom's paper, he had a very interesting statement um, in which he argued that if past patterns of political strategies persist, Abe will be forced to either give up his nationalist rhetoric or be forced out of office as centrist allies abandon him. And I'm wondering if today perhaps the political context of these discussions has changed in ways that aren't necessarily recognized in either Lenz or um, Tom's paper. I'm wondering if changes to the electoral system, the increasing decline in the electoral influence of groups like the war bereaved associations, this is something that I hope Nat might, not might, also, be, not, uh, might also be able to talk about, uh, and other changes within the electoral and political system that really are pushing for a more robust leadership role by, our prime, by the Prime Minister of Japan may be clearing a space for Abe to achieve some of his goals and sometimes in ways that others might feel are offensive. So uh, I'll leave it at that. Um, I thank the panelists. I think this was a terrific opening session and I'd like to now open the floor to, to questions. Um, before I do that, I wonder if any, uh, any of the panelists would like to speak to each other or to some of the issues I raised or should we go immediately to the floor? It's up to you, but have you go the floor first? Okay. Um, I thought I would take our questions in groups of three, and if you would identify yourself before you ask your, ask your question, that would be great. Yes, please. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, Japan's idea. Is it okay? Uh, ideal country is Switzerland. We want to be like Switzerland. Okay, and that's how we uh, we were raised just after the war, and then um, we are now here. Uh, we don't look like Switzerland. Uh, <laughs> and uh, when we are talk, I was talking with all um, other Japanese friends. Uh, we envy. Germany, uh, when you want to have a no, uh, be a normal country like Japan, uh, G Germany has a, a, a draft system, and then 
um, yet the other thing uh, was I was arguing that like uh, some kind of Zaitokai guy and uh, yeah, a few weeks ago Germany arrested a uh, former Nazi, 90, 94 years old g man and uh, uh, Senkov was paid some somebody in the Jews uh, restoration. Okay, so uh, when we want to be Japan, uh, Japan wants to be a normal country. They need to apologize to comfort women, or they need to <coughs> arrest some, you know, uh, the war criminals by themselves, not like from American. That's what I f feel. But <laughs> how do you think about it? And the other one is a uh, uh, question to. Um, the last person, I forgot the name, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, about Zaitokai, I was talking about one, one guy, I was arguing in a Twitter, and he, <laughs> 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 he fi finally said some, you know, I was, uh, one, uh, you know, one guy Zaitokai versus three of us, <laughs> and, uh, and I was uh, listening, and uh, he said that his grandfather was Korean, and uh, his father became Japanese. So basically he's Korean, to my mind, <laughs> not like that. So what is Zaitokai? And wha you know, what those people, uh, you know, wha wha why he's there against Kore you know, Zainichi? And the uh, other one is uh, Toichi Sensei uh, Gyugun. Uh, did they go to uh, uh, Henoko in Okinawa? Okay, yeah, that's good. Yeah. Hard if we could take two, is a mic. Your questions, yeah. In order to understand uh, left wing, uh, right wing, we got to also understand left wing in Japan because it's a pendulum kind of movement. And uh, uh, I was curious how much you know the American people know about you know Japanese left wing, uh, because you know the uh, uh, for example, I was graduating from high school in 1978, and at that time, uh, whether it's possible uh, to have you know the uh, Japanese national flag hoisted at the uh, graduation ceremony, or uh, can uh, uh, it would be possible to sing national anthem in Japan? Uh, that was still a kind of controversy, uh, which is incredible in the United States. And uh, uh, actually, the uh, principal of my high school, uh, he had a mustache, and uh, uh, he a little bit looked like Hitler. <laughs> and <laughs> uh, there was a criticism of him becoming being too nationalistic. And so, uh, uh, how uh, does it sound to American people? That's what I wanted to know. Hey, you guys have talked uh, about the Japanese nationalism in terms of uh, its historic and uh, kind of relationship with other Asian nations, as well as the US. Um, my question is, uh, uh, is there any impact from Japan's recent involvement with the uh, the global and the terrorism in the Middle East, because you all know ISIS, a terrorist or group, I guess sees a couple of Japanese <coughs> citizens ask for a huge amount of ransom, uh, and Japanese uh, Abe government uh, declined the ransom, which resulted in the unfortunate murder of Japanese citizens. Um, so w would that be, in the long term, be just a small footnote, footnote in the whole Japanese um, nationalism, or you think it might have some impact on how it's going to go forward? Thank you. Start with Nathaniel or work down the um, So uh, to get back to the, the very initial Okay, to get back to the very initial questions, um, how are they a movement? It, it sort of varies in, in size and, and estimation. How being the, the, the 
parliamentarian who founded the Dining Hall Michael Bill. At some point, apocry apocryphally, uh, received the highest. Long time after that, that became the number that was used to designate how many rightist group members there are in Japan, because obviously, so, so it went, those are the ones that would vote for him. Um, in terms of uh, street activists, uh, I, I would say, okay. if you want to include the groups that are aligned with organized crime groups um, that have these big demonstrations with multiple sound trucks in that first picture with all the guys lined up, um, you may be up around 10,000, but those people aren't full-time activists. They have um, but those numbers get tossed around by people that are writing from the right, about the right. And so I haven't done surveys or something like that. Um, what defines them in the post-war years, it was anti-communism and support for the imperial. Very disparate backgrounds and interests to um, So that has kind of fallen, fallen apart. Um, in my broader work, I argue that the, the kinds of acts, the kinds of activism that they employ have been uh, part of how they've been able to move beyond this dissolution of the left as the enemy that allowed us to define um, as a movement. Um, in terms of moving toward violence, I, I don't necessarily think so. It happens from time to time. Um, what would be more interesting is if the Zaitokukai, these new uh, kind of anti-immigrant groups, became more violent. But generally, and interesting meaning terrible, um, but generally the way that the, the pre-existing right-wing groups talk about the Zaitokukai is that they're just people from the internet who aren't used to sort of actually doing things on the street and they don't really have uh, sort of the, the, the credibility or the sort of strength to go through with the kinds of acts that we go through with. Um, that said though, you know, for, to, the, to whatever extent the rightist groups in Japan look like they're an army, they don't really act like an army, right? They're not necessarily taking over things and attacking. When a rightist activist does something that is uh, sort of uh, an illegal act of terror or something like that, they usually do it as one person and then turn themselves in afterwards, right? And so there's a kind of, uh, you know, uh, claiming. People from the right don't go underground after sort of uh, after terror. Um, I'm just going to jump to the question of, of Japan and the Middle East. Um, and, and also the, the pendulum right to left is a very interesting one, and it's something that is part of the creation of the new right in terms of an activist movement. They were definitely engaged with, the, with what the left was up to and what sort of average students were up to. Um, and they're very cognizant of those, those shifts. And so where sort of the ideological breakdown um, happens and where it sort of pulls out into left and right categories is something that they write about and they're interested in, very much so. So, but the, the Middle Eastern question is interesting because a lot of what the, the more radical right do in the contemporary period is to clock back to Pan-Asianism and talk partially to get beyond the right-left divide of the Cold War and the way that the right in Japan was seen as being the running dogs of the Americans or something like that. They want to go back to an earlier uh, generation. And people like Okawa Shume, um, like one of the architects of Pan-Asianism, is a, a relatively, still to this day, a, a very large figure. He casts a very large shadow on sort of anti-establishment, far right-wing activism. And he was an Islamist. He, he translated the Quran. He was interested in tracing sort of connections that Japan had to the Middle East. Um, so I think that's one of the things that's referenced when um, Japanese rightists that are in this sort of uh, more anti-establishment, anti-American um, uh, group uh, talk about sort of support for ethnic self-determination in the Middle East or uh, the Iraqis under U.S. sanction. It's, it's often through that same lens. So on the, on the left-wing question, the, the, uh, I think that's the big, biggest change observed across the episodes that I discuss in my paper, so that the left plays a major dramatic role in, in protests and the violence and the death of a student all contribute to his having to resign from office and, and his professors moving quite dramatically back away from his agenda towards the Yoshida doctrine. So the left plays a huge role at that time. When the, in the Nakasone episode, the, the left is still very vocal and very much participating, criticizing Nakasone, <coughs> not nearly as, as uh, significant as it was um, in 1960, but, but I'm still on the stage. But by the time you get to the 2000s, um, it's really hard for me <coughs> to, to 
that was an important part of, a, of the story of the, of the backlash. That now the, there's still nervousness among a substantial portion of the Japanese population about uh, moves in a nationalist direction, especially these in-your-face acts. Those are not supported by a large portion of the Japanese public, but they're, they're not organized socialist left in the way that they were before. The, the, the real change as a result of party system realignment in Japan after 1993 was obviously not the disappearance of the LDP or the split of the LDP. Um, that carries on, but the disappearance of the Japanese Socialist Party is a significant player, and the uh, passing of, of, of the guard. So if you see that the uh, anti-constitutional reform um, demonstrations, yeah, they still do happen. They tend to be full of gray-haired people, right? Um, maybe with canes. Um, so <laughs> the, you, you don't, you don't uh, see very many young people at all in those protests on that issue anymore. Um, you do have some new left in Japan, and that wasn't discussed. That's not really on our on our agenda today, especially on, after 311 and the anti-nuclear protesters. And you see young people coming back in the streets to protest against uh, conservative policies on things like energy, but um, they're not a part of this story as much. I don't think. I don't know if uh, if Tom or somebody else. I'll, I'll just limit my comments to that and let Tom talk about the Switzerland and, and envy of Germany. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, I'm going to be very, I'm going to try to be uh, brief <laughs> again. Um, and let me take sort of a couple of the smaller questions first in terms of the impact of the terrorist event on, you know, historically Japan has been actually very soft on terrorism. There was a famous incident back in the 1970s where the prime minister at the time just completely gave in to some terrorists who took over a plane and then they paid them off and they released um, uh, people who are associated with a left-wing terrorist organization. Um, uh, even more recently in the 2000s, um, the, the behind the scenes it's rumored that the payoffs were made to release Japanese uh, hostages. Um, uh, and what's interesting is that this time Abe, even though he continued to use the language that we are going to protect and preserve human life, that's going to be our top priority, he drew a line and he allowed that to happen, uh, allowed these poor people to be, uh, to be killed. Um, in terms of the response to that, um, it's kind of funny. You know, some people saying, yes, you know, we are now at last standing up and, and being stronger. On the other hand, you also say, well, you know, we shouldn't be in the Middle East in the first place, <laughs> and, and these are the kinds of terrible things which happen if we get involved in world politics. So it, it cuts both ways. Switzerland or Germany as a model, Japan often wishes it could be sort of like uh, Switzerland escape to sound of music like, like Julia <laughs> Andrews, <laughs> twist, you know, turning in the field. Um, it, obviously, East Asia doesn't look very much like it, <laughs> right? Um, uh, now, in terms of the German question, the German model, um, Look, there are no solutions to these historical issues. There are no, there's no moral, magical, uh, <laughs> mystical way of determining what is the proper response. Yeah? I mean, uh, how much compensation should you give to a former comfort woman? What kind of apology, what kind of amends should you make to somebody or to people who come from a village where there was a massacre? What the different generations, after all, after we're now in the third, fourth generation since the end of World War II, what is the intergenerational level of responsibility? Yeah, I mean, the whole notion of collective de guilt is profoundly uncomfortable. Though I did have a captain once who told me, an American captain, who said, you know, I was raised believing in collective, uh, being proud in the military, you know, pr collective pride. Well, if there's collective pride, there should be the possibility for collective guilt, <laughs> that we do have a different kind of responsibility. So I don't want to rule that out. But in any case, I mean, there is no answer to these questions. And in the end, the answers are going to become political. That is, what is it that leaderships in countries who are responsible in different ways to their populations feel is an appropriate response. And that's, you know, that's the only way we can approach these questions. Should Japan start you know, looking for people who uh, abused Chinese and Koreans and others mm. generations ago? Uh, personally, I find that it, nobody's asking for them to do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> 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 but, but I mean, I think it would be, you know, uh, I don't know what to feel about fe looking at these 94-year-old former concentration camp guys. I mean, they did terrible things. If you look at the court records, 
it scares the hell out of you. You know, literally one person can be responsible for the death of hundreds, if not thousands, of people. You know, popping a, a canister of cyclone, you know, Z gas into uh, into a, a gas chamber. Uh, does uh, there's a? I don't want to go on too long about this. I've worked on this stuff. It's very emotional <laughs> for me, but even more for the people who are involved. Um, one line which a German parliamentarian says: "You know, grass grows over every field. You know, that means that you know, over with time, heal wounds all things. But grass doesn't grow over Auschwitz. Yeah? Does grass grow over s Nanjing? Does grass? I mean, it's, it's impossible to determine. It's a political answer in the end. Um, now, d does Japan need a spiritual infrastructure? Um, uh, I don't know. Every country probably does. It is you know, nationalism is a way in which we transcend." individual logic and appeal to people to act on the basis of collective interests. You need something that allows people as a society to organize. It can be religion. It I wish it could be you know, notions of we're all part of a global community and working together, right? Uh, unfortunately, we don't have that. Uh, you have to work with what is a spiritual basis which is uh, convincing. Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> because you, you know, the, your, your illustration of the uh, nationalist who asked the Japanese to have manners, you know, That's uh, a great reminded me of the fact that there is, this, there is a strong sense in Japan of collective responsibility and that the people need to defend their, their neighborhoods from crime. You get lots of people turn out and say, we need to work together to make the place um, safer, um, traffic problems, People will get involved and, and volunteer their time to solve all kinds of local community safety issues. So why can't that be the basis for building this pride instead of the historical, we've got to question the historical narrative to build pride? Um, well, because it's there. That is, there are people who feel that that's necessary. Yeah. Right? I mean, again, there is nothing that you know, is implicit in the, you know, nothing well, I mean, fixing the, way, the ground. The way that most anthropologists talk about Japan and Japanese cultural nationalism. You have sort of these wonderful products and things and lineages and traditions and arts and things like that that, you know, wari wari nihonjin, like the nihonjin ron, all of these sort of ways of understanding what makes Japanese Japanese uh, and w what accounts for the amazing success in the post-war years. There's a whole host of literature around that that doesn't necessarily preclude sort of a rehashing of, of history, but doesn't necessarily inspire them. Well, but I think that, again, question is what are you trying to mobilize people for and the defense the right is concerned about security issues mm -hmm. so can you mobilize people on the basis of your skill at manga <laughs> right <laughs> to possibly fight against the Chinese <laughs> but I think, uh, that, I think the point that it would shift really quickly were China to actually attack Japan right I think so you know and I think Japanese have for better I think more than worse the idea of you know of the fact that you can grow up and, and live an interesting and fulfilling life in Japan and not have to worry about being conscripted that's a really wonderful thing. I think. Can I just take one more question from that? So I was wondering, as you guys were all talking about, uh, as you guys were talking about the phenomenon of Japanese nationalism, uh, to what extent do the nationalist groups in Japan talk about or think about? demographic and natalist issues and policies. Because, of course, in something like Russian nationalism or Israeli nationalism, just to take two examples, uh, natalism and thinking about you know, how many children are we having is a huge component of the, the ethnic vision of the future. And so Putin, for example, uh, talks a lot about the need for Russians to have more children or else nationalism is just futile. Uh, that is, over the long term, it, it becomes pointless. And since Japan has perhaps a more acute demographic crisis and shrinking birth rate and demographic death spiral than any other major country in the world, this would seem to be a serious priority, or would have to be going forward for anybody who has a kind of long-term vision of Japanese ethnic nationalism. To what extent does this figure into the conversation among these groups? Start with an answer talking more about the mainstream politics, and maybe you can, I don't know, whether the Uh, you talked about uh, raise this issue at all, but you, certainly in pre-war Japanese nationalism, uh, natalism was a major part of, of government policy. It was a major major nation. Japan felt it was its population was much smaller than China's or Russia's, um, and they very much tried to mobilize the people, the women, 
children to make Japan a stronger country. But partly because of that history, it's very sensitive for any politician, even a conservative one, to too openly uh, advocate for natalism today. So the declining population problem has been known. You know, the <laughs> statistics have been clear since at least 1990. Okay, time. And for, for, there were some initial conservative comments about, if you look at the statistical trends and you project them forward in 1,000 years, there will be no more Jap <laughs> Japanese. Um, and there's some conservatives did point this out and, and suggest that we need to that Japanese should have more babies. But there was no organized, concerted move to, to really act on that for a long period of time. Um, more recently, you do see the conservatives in Japan having a pro-family policy. Womenomics is in part motivated by, by this um, issue. But it's not clear that there's any solution. So nobody is talking about reducing, you know, taking the abortion regulations or something to